Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello and welcome back to NanoHub U's Introduction to Bioelectricity. We are in week three and in this third lecture of week three we're going to talk about observations from action potentials. So what can we learn about these models by measuring action potentials. And before we get to that, let's go back and revisit a little bit of what we talked about with the core conductor equation. So in the core conductor model, we describe the relationship between the currents inside and outside the cell, the membrane current Km through the cell membrane, and the membrane voltage. But we don't say anything about what the membrane itself is made out of and what that equivalent circuit looks like. And so using the observations that we're going to make in this class, we're going to begin to say things about uh, what that membrane equivalent circuit is. But before we get there, let's go back to the core conductor equation that we derived at the end of the last lecture. And the core conductor equation relates the second derivative with respect to, respect to distance of the membrane voltage, which is a function of both space and time, to the sum of the impedance per unit length outside the cell and the impedance per unit length inside the cell, multiply times the membrane current per unit length Km, and then with this additional term, which is the product of the impedance outside the, the cell and the membrane uh, current added by an external electrode, for example, by a stimulus pulse, Ke, as a function of Z and T. So we have this added term, but we have a relationship really between the second derivative of the membrane voltage and the membrane current. Now we have this equation, which is one equation with two unknowns. In order to solve this, we would need to add a second equation with the same two unknowns. And that's what we're working towards. So with no external current Ke, so we set Ke equal to zero, this equation becomes the second derivative of the membrane voltage is equal to the sum of the external and internal impedances multiplied times the membrane current Km, which can be rearranged in terms of the membrane current being equal to 1 over a sum of impedances times the second derivative of the membrane voltage. Okay. Now, if we go back to the core conductor model, the equivalent circuit that we had for the, neuro, the axon, without taking into account the membrane itself, which is described in this black box, so it's not described at all just yet, we can do Kirchhoff's current law at node C, sum the currents into the node, know that they're equal to the currents out of the node. That's what Kirchhoff's current law is. And we find that IO, which is the current outside the cell, plus the membrane current per unit length, multiplied times that infinitesimal segment length delta Z, is equal to IO, which is the current outside the cell at a point delta Z later, plus whatever current you've added to the system. So the current into here is equal to the current out of here. And that we can rearrange and we can take the limits and find that the derivative of the current IO with respect to Z is equal to Km minus Ke. So it's the difference between IO and Z and IO at Z plus delta Z and we take the limit as delta Z goes to zero and we get this equation here. And then we can set Ke equal to zero and substitute that last equation into equation one to get a relationship between the membrane voltage and the current outside of the cell, which we can then integrate and find that the current outside of the cell as a function of z and t is equal to one over Ro plus Ri times the first derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to z. All right. If an action potential now propagates at a constant velocity v. How do we describe the relationship between the membrane voltage, the current outside the cell, and the current in the membrane per unit length? We know that the membrane voltage is the second derivative, or sorry, the second derivative of the membrane voltage is the current in the membrane per unit length. And we know the first derivative of the membrane voltage is the current outside the cell. So we have that relationship. If we can take a constant velocity v, then we can describe the membrane voltage as a function of z and t as a function of t plus z over v. So with a constant velocity v, time and space become related. So they're not interchange, they're not independent of one another. Space becomes dependent on time because the velocity is constant. So and this this approximation is fairly accurate in a neuron. So with this approximation in mind, 
the membrane voltage as a function of two variables can be described really as a function of a single variable with this constant in the middle. And that allows us to calculate the derivatives of the membrane voltage. And the first derivative with respect to z is going to be equal to partial partial z of the function, which is going to be equal to 1 over v, the velocity, times the derivative of the function. This, the derivative with respect to time is going to be equal to the derivative with respect to time of the function, which is just going to be f prime. And we can do the same thing for the second derivative. So the partial derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to distance is going to be 1 over the velocity times the partial derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to time. And the second derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to distance is going to be equal to 1 over the velocity squared times the second derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to time. And now we can substitute equation 1 into equation 2, and we can find that the membrane voltage, which we had previously described in terms of 1 over RO plus RI times the partial derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to z squared, we can now express at a constant velocity as 1 over RO plus RI times the velocity squared times the second derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to time squared. And similarly, for the current outside of the cell, 1 over RO plus RI times the velocity multiplied times the partial derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to time. So we've switched from the derivative with respect to z to the, respect to the derivative with respect to time. And if we have the derivative with respect to time, then if we know the time-dependent shape of the membrane voltage, we can draw, we can, by inspection, say something about what the membrane current is and what the membrane uh, or what the current outside of the cell is. So if we have Vm and we plot Vm and it looks like an action potential and here we've set the resting membrane potential as the origin. So at the origin it's at minus 65 millivolts, the action potential begins, the member, the sodium ion channels open, sodium rushes in, the voltage goes up, it peaks, the transient inward current ends, the delayed outward current begins, and there's some overlap in there, but as the delayed outward current begins, potassium ions begin rushing back out of the cell to re-establish the neuron's resting potential. And the voltage drops, the membrane voltage drops again, there's some undershoot before it settles out. Now that's the shape of the membrane voltage. So what's the membrane current? Well, without solving a single equation, we can just by saying that we know IO is the first derivative and KM is the second derivative, we can draw what the membrane current looks like. So we can draw IO by saying wherever the slope is highest, you're going to have a peak. Wherever the slope is zero, you're going to have a zero crossing. And whenever the slope is most negative, you're going to have a trough. So you can draw by inspection IO as a function of time because we know it's the first derivative and a constant factor. So we don't know the amplitude, but we know the shape. And then because we know that Km is the second derivative, we can draw the derivative of IO. And so you can by inspection see that the membrane current, you're going to have a net outward current, and then a net inward current, and then another net outward current as you hyperpolarize. And that gives you a sense about the relationships between currents and voltages just by inspection and just intuitively. Now everything we're saying, we're saying with respect to time. What happens with respect to distance? So again, if we have a action potential that propagates down the neuron, it travels down the neuron at a constant velocity, can we draw that action potential, the voltage, as a function of distance along the neuron? So the action potential, when it's happening at one point, there's stuff going on at other points as well. So the membrane is repolarizing or depolarizing uh, immediately before and after the cell. And so we can draw it not just as a function of time, but we should be able to draw it as a function of distance. So let's take an action potential that begins at time t equals zero and travels some amount of distance down the cell. When it's gone some distance down the cell, it'll begin. Right, so let's say that we have, we have the axon hillock, the action potential begins at the axon hillock at time t equals zero. If we look at a point some distance removed from the axon hillock, the action potential won't begin at time t equals zero because it takes some time to get there. It'll begin at some time shortly after t equals zero. And at that time shortly after t equals zero, sodium ions will begin to rush in. Potassium ions will then rush out. You'll hyperpolarize and the action potential will end as a function of time. So over time, at some point, you're going to see this shape. What does it look like over distance? At time t equals zero, what is the action potential in the cell? And the answer is, well, there is no action potential because it's time t equals zero. 
it's just about to begin in the axon hillock, so the entire cell is sitting at the resting membrane potential of minus 65, which recall we've normalized as the origin. So the entire cell is sitting there polarized at minus 65 millivolts at time t equals zero. After some time, let's say a millisecond goes by, you have an action potential which is traveling at a velocity of 25 meters per second. And 25 meters per second is 2.5 centimeters per millisecond, if you recall your dimensional analysis. And we say that we've traveled one millisecond. Well, in one millisecond, you've gone 2.5 centimeters per millisecond is 2.5 centimeters. That means that two and a half centimeters out, your action potential is going to be just about to begin. And sooner, closer to the axon hillock, the action potential has already begun and some amount of it has transpired. And so as you move towards the axon hillock, you will see that shape of the action potential reproduced, but as a mirror image of what you would see in the time domain. So this is after one millisecond. If you wait two and a half milliseconds, two and a half milliseconds at two and a half centimeters per millisecond is going to be about six and a quarter uh, centimeters. And so six and a quarter centimeters out, you're going to see the beginning of your action potential. And you're gonna draw it back from that. Now, if you recall, when we plotted it out in time, the action potential was about two milliseconds in duration. And they can vary from about a millisecond to maybe two or three milliseconds, typically. But this one that we drew was two milliseconds in duration in time. So if it's a two millisecond action potential and it travels at two and a half centimeters per millisecond, then the entire spatial extent of the action potential is five centimeters. If it's beginning at six and a quarter centimeters, because we're at time 2.5, then and it's five centimeters long, then it should end at about one and a quarter. And so this will contain the entirety of our action potential. And the shape is exactly the mirror image of what you would expect to see if you plotted it as a function of time. So being able to move back and forth from the time domain to the space domain is a key concept of this lecture. Being able to understand why the shape of the action potential is as we expect it to be in the time domain, and then it becomes the mirror image in the space domain is an essential component as well. Um, that, that, that gives you the intuitive understanding that the action potential doesn't begin here and move forwards. It begins here at the origin, at the axon hillock, and it travels out. So wherever you are and you're measuring it, what happens after in time occurs before in space. Okay, so moving on from that observation, we begin to look at what happens in these neurons when you depolarize them with a current pulse. And what happens is that you can take a current pulse and you can give them a square current pulse. And you would expect that if you were to feed that current pulse across a resistor, you would see a voltage pulse, a square voltage pulse, same shape. Uh, it would look exactly the same in this red pulse. The amplitude would be different. different. And the reason it would be different is because from Ohm's law, we know that the voltage would equal, be equal to the product of the current and the resistance. So we would multiply this amplitude times the fixed resistance and you would get the square pulse. But in fact, when you do it in a cell, you don't see a square pulse you see these curves. And these curves would indicate that the impedance of the membrane is complex. It is not resistive, or it's not exclusively resistive. It is complex. There are also capacitive components. And so that leads to the question of, well, what does it look like? What does that equivalent circuit look like? And the way we get at the answer is by using these pulses, measuring the resulting voltage and dividing the voltage voltage by the current, we get the complex impedance. So instead of using a pulse, which has a lot of high frequency harmonics, we can use a sine wave. And a sine wave, which contains a single pure tone at a single frequency, will give us the relationship between voltage and current as a function of frequency. And then we can plot that. We can measure it and we can plot it. So if we measure the impedance as a function of frequency on a logarithmic scale, you'll find that at very low frequencies, close to DC, you'll have some fixed impedance. And that impedance will stay fixed for a while. But at some frequency, the impedance will begin to roll off. And then at another frequency, it'll level back out. And these frequencies and these impedances all have names. So we look at this, we look at this measurement, this measured data, we look at the measured data, and from this we can, we can intuit what is the mechanism that underlies each of these different impedance segments. And so when we look at the initial fixed 
impedance when the impedance is fixed as a function of frequency that's what a resistor is so resistors are not complex they're real and they are independent of frequency and so the impedance of a resistor is just r and it's r it's r it's r all day long it doesn't care about frequency and so because this is frequency independent there's no change with frequency we know this is resistive and at low frequencies in fact we would expect that resistance to be the membrane resistance now at some frequency the impedance begins to roll off. And when that impedance begins to roll off, that's what a capacitor looks like. So the impedance of a capacitor, Z sub C, is equal to 1 over the square root of negative 1, J, times omega, the angular frequency, which is 2 pi times the frequency of the signal that we're using to stimulate, times the capacitance itself. And what we find is that there's a beautiful capacitive linear relationship here where the impedance looks like 1 over j omega c. And that capacitance corresponds to the membrane capacitance. Recall, the membrane is a lipid bilayer with a charge of potassium ions on the outside of the membrane, an excess number of potassium ions on the outside of the membrane, and an excess number of unbalanced anions, negatively charged ions, on the inside of the membrane. And those form a capacitor, two conductive plates separated by an insulator the phospholipid bilayer. And so that impedance, Cm, is what we see in this frequency component. And then at very high frequencies, it settles back out and it looks like a resistor again. And so we find that that impedance at high values, R sub C, is the cytoplasmic resistance. But it turns out that the impedances at which R sub C begin to dominate are, sorry, the frequencies at which R sub C begins to dominate the overall impedance are those at which biological signals do not occur. So it is actually not very important what happens out here because no biological signal that we're interested in is going to be in this domain. We're always going to be in a domain where either RM, the membrane impedance, membrane resistance, or CM, the membrane capacitance, dominates. And then of course we can calculate the pole, which is the point at which the membrane resistance and the membrane capacitance are equal. And so half of the current will flow through the membrane capacitance and half of it will flow through uh, the memory resistance, and then we can calculate the zero, which is the point at which the, member, the, the impedance of the memory capacitor and the impedance of R sub C are equal, at which point half of the current or the voltage drop will be distributed across each of these two impedances, and that's where R sub C begins to dominate. And all these values can be calculated. And from this, we can draw an equivalent circuit. And the equivalent circuit looks like this. So we have our core conductor circuit, where we have the impedance per unit length inside the cell multiplied times the length of the unit, and the impedance per unit length outside the cell multiplied times the length of the unit, and we have the membrane current and the membrane voltage. But now we've tried changing Km as a function of frequency, measuring Vm, dividing Vm by Km, which we know to be what we're stimulating with, and calculating this black box. And from that curve, we found that the equivalent circuit, the black box, is composed of three these three components. It's the membrane resistor in parallel with the membrane capacitor, which is itself in series with the cytoplasmic resistance inside the cell. So if you're uh, current and you're sitting outside the cell and you want to flow in or inside the cell and you want to flow out, you're looking at these this equivalent circuit. If it's a low frequency a signal, it's going to flow through RM. If it's a high frequency signal, it's going to flow through CM. At some impedance, uh, so, so the impedance of Cm is 1 over omega C. At very high frequencies, that tends towards 0. And when the impedance of this becomes 0, it's just R sub C, because R sub C is in series with it. But what I've said earlier is that it, the frequencies at which that happens don't occur in biological systems, so we can really neglect the R sub C term. It's included in the lecture just for completeness. Really, we're concerned either with low-frequency signals, which are dominated by the membrane impedance RM, and high-frequency signals, which are dominated by the membrane's membrane capacitance, C sub M. So now that we have our equivalent circuit, we can take this equivalent circuit, and we can come up with equations that describe the relationship between voltage and current through the circuit, and get our second equation with two unknowns that would allow us to look at the core conductor equation in more depth. And that's what we'll begin to do in our le next lecture on the cable model. And I'll see you then.